Thank you very much, Eden. Um, well, good afternoon. Welcome to this very interesting panel discussion. We think at CNFA that in order to address the need for global food security, the private sector industry should have a major, a critical role in, in working in this main challenge. And today, I'm very pleased to briefly introduce you four great uh, speakers under uh, the leadership of Gail Mitchell with the Michael Foods. Uh, she will be our moderator for today. The first speaker will be Mr. Vasily Bumakov, the former Minister of Agriculture of the Republic of uh, Moldova, following by uh, Mr. Rob Smith, from ADCO, coming from Germany, and uh, Mr. Dr. Smith is Senior Vice President for, at ADCO for Europe, uh, Middle East, and in Africa. <laughs> then we have Mr. Jay Vroom. Jay is the President uh, and CEO of Crop Life America. And then we, we have Mr. Jason Hoffman, who is the Editor of Trade and Agriculture for Politico Pro here in Washington. Um, that said, I would like to invite my coach, my mentor, my predecessor, the former uh, president and CEO of CNFA and the new chairman of the board of directors of CNFA Europe, Mr. John Costello, to introduce our first speaker today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Uh, let me say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. It, this indeed is a very special event. Uh, uh, you know, the, the transition that we've talked about in the last couple of days from the first 30 years to what I think now is going to be an even more brilliant and new future under your leadership. and. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do today was just have a very brief focus on the past while well, really uh, focusing most of our time and attention this afternoon on the future. And uh, as we looked through CNFA's past, which has really been remarkable in Africa, uh, the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, and, uh, and Georgia, which continues today, uh, the, the very heart of our effort has been to empower enterprise, to leverage capital and technology and know-how, to build local enterprises, and to empower private farmers. And, so, the, and nowhere have we done that more with a transformational impact than in Moldova. And we were fortunate enough to get the opportunity under uh, Greg Huger's leadership as mission director for Ukraine and Moldova in 1995 uh, to begin to work in Moldova. And we, and we were there for 15 years. And one of the core elements of our success in Moldova uh, was the fact that we were able to assemble such an incredibly talented team of Moldovans who really really were at the forefront in leadership, and one of the leaders of that effort uh, on our staff at that time was Vasily Bumakov. And uh, so I have known Vasily for over 20 years. He's a friend, and it's such a wonderful opportunity for me to, uh, to have you here as a very special person uh, marking the, the transition of CNFA to, to new leadership. And uh, uh, he's a highly talented expert in high value agriculture. Vasily is an engineer. I can't, I, I, I think that many times they've been out there, and Rob, maybe you ought to talk to Vasily or at least take, take him to dinner, but he was always 
fiddling with some design of a new plow or planting equipment, m many of which are used all over Moldova today. But in any event, in Moldova, we had a transformational impact. We had all the tools in the toolbox. And what was remarkable is that we had the opportunity to leverage about $30 million worth of private capital. And that produced a probably I, I can't remember exactly the figures, but it's a three to four to one match. And that's local entrepreneurs standing up and investing their own resources. And, and uh, we, we, when I say transformational, we introduce things like cold storage atmosphere, quick freezing, instant freezing, we, all sorts of uh, new new uh, high value agriculture techniques in processing and packaging, uh, and created a network of 86 farm stores that served Moldovan farmers. And I think 57 of these stores exist today. And they're supported by a company called Agristock, which we helped invent. And Agristock is now the second largest agribusiness in Moldova. So, Vasily, a warm welcome to you. And uh, we look f very much, we look forward very much to you kind of giving the bird's eye view from Moldova's perspective on how we work together in Moldova. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am really honored today to be here and have this chance to congratulate you on the 30th anniversary, not myself only, but on behalf of the Moldovan farmers and Moldovan government, and to say a few good words about the people who had this ingenious idea to create such a company. I. Uh, have this chance to tell you what was CNFA for Moldova, how we managed to transform a Soviet system or an agriculture under the Soviet system into a market oriented. And uh, this is something very serious. If at the beginning many people here will ask, and, and what? Okay, USSR collapsed in 1991. And go ahead and do business. But I would like to tell you that uh, we've been in a very, very difficult situation. Challenge number one at that time used to be mentality. You know, before that, to be a farmer, to do business, to be an entrepreneur, it was a criminal affair in the Soviet system. Can you imagine how difficult it was to start to do farming, to start business in the, in the agriculture? And the problem of mentality, everybody knows, is not so simple to fix. It takes years. And I want to tell you that uh, only very committed friends, sorry not to say crazy, <laughs> can, can come to a foreign country and take the risk to change this mentality, to start a new type of agriculture, a new type of business. And I want to tell you that the first used to be United States government through the programs like USAID, like USDA, later MCC. And of course, this was the chance for the CNFA to come to Moldova and share its experience. I recently returned from a trip. I was contracted as an FAO expert in uh, in Middle Asia. And I have today more rights to tell about your successes and our successes in Moldova than if I would not see what was there without you, without your support. You know, uh, in my country, even uh, not a very big country, officials don't like to talk much about agriculture. And even at that moment, they didn't see the potential of this sector. So when Americans came to Moldova, they made a very important assessment. And they realized that our future, well, let's say nearest future, 
or it's our chance to get rid of poverty, it's agriculture. Because we have good soils, we have hardworking people, but we didn't have idea of inputs, we didn't have idea of technologies, we didn't have many, many other things which a farmer would need. And I, and I want to say that for you, this, for many of you, this looks, and what? But I tell you, this is something very complicated, extremely complicated. And he is like, we needed at that time a partnership between public and private. Okay, the state was not ready to be a, a reliable partner in the rebuilding market-oriented agriculture. Not because they didn't want to, maybe, but all the officials were coming from the same system which the farmers were coming from. And uh, they had no this potential. And it was CNFA to substitute this important local government as a public partner to bring closer to it the, the, the farmers, the peasants, let's say, at that time. And you know, uh, this started in the uh, beginning of 90s, 92, and CNFA, as John said here, what first did they put together a professional team. Maybe it was not so professional at the, at, at the beginning. It was a good selection. But they have been well trained. They had very good friends to, to find this uh, friendly approach to tell them that what you know is not what you need. We have to do something else. And I want to tell you, dear friends, today that all members of this first team and the teams which came later now having very important position in the country and abroad. Some of them are working as ministers, some as deputy ministers. We have director of IFAD program coming from CNFA team. We have representative of uh, United Nations and FAO abroad and so on. So this was a great start at that time and the other thing was very important. Let's uh, remember that we had two empires. And uh, we were a small country, but we used to be a member of one of the biggest empires in the world. And we were told that it was the most just and the best one in the world. And the others used to be our enemies. And now, how can you work with those people which look at you and they think who they are? They are these are rooting Capitalism, you know. <laughs> so uh, so I, I would like to thank you very much for the intelligence you had and you could convince authorities and farmers to be close with you and work with you. Of course, we had uh, uh, an important program, land privatization program, which is a very difficult story in all post-Soviet area and many of the countries they don't want to give the land to their people. They don't want to do that. Look at Russia. They have more land than anybody in the world. But they don't want to give the land to their people. So United States of America government helped us to privatize the land and help <coughs> farmers to start real, real farming. But people got the land. What about the rest? And now CNFA came with an ingenious idea to create... Uh, these farm stores, which was a kind of input supply. Because farmers, they didn't have access to the, the inputs. Or the people who are selling inputs in Moldova, you know, when the business is not clear, always you find very strange people doing business. And everybody is trying to fool farmer and make more profit. So this was one of the steps to bring farmers to the farm store and not give him only inputs, but give advice and support and connections. I would say another program, which we never discussed about this, uh, John, before, but the first dealership of machinery, which was Massey Ferguson and Agco today, was created by CNFA in Moldova, because we had a wild market of machinery. And, uh, you know, it, it, everybody was selling machinery, but nobody knew how to do service and spare parts. So we fixed this problem. And today Moldova has a very good network of dealers. You have John Deere, you have New Holland, whatever in the world. 
and it works perfect, and farmers can choose machinery. <coughs> you know, uh, for, uh, for small producers, cooperation is really important. Of course, we had a big difficulty on cooperating because we were coming out from Kolkhoz, which was nominated as cooperative, which was uh, a lie because it was not a cooperative. It was a state management, but it was so kindly named cooperative. And when our friends Americans said, okay, guys, how are you going to sell vegetables? How are you going to sell uh, fruits? Having a uh, few cases there if you don't cooperate. And everybody said, again, Kolkhoz? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a very hard work. And it was created Agrostock co Cooperative, which uh, has more than 120 members. And they were used to not just being created and somehow working and disappearing later. It was getting stronger and stronger. And today is one of the strongest cooperative, which is helping farmers with the high quality seeds, with the good fertilizer and many other important inputs. Another very important story it is high value agriculture, a term introduced by CNFA in Moldova. I'm very proud that I took part in elaboration of this strategy for Moldova because our friends from the United States easily noticed that not wheat and corn is our future. We don't have fields where you can put a driver, a combine harvest and a tractor and harvest and uh, make big profits because we have very rich, very good fertile land, but small areas. And we have the chance to grow very tasty and very good quality fruits and vegetables. And this is how you made this um, very important document in two books, which used to be a guideline for all the other investors in Moldova, for all the projects, IFAD and many others, and MCC and many others, today are working with this document. And, uh, but the best proof of the efficiency of this idea, what you've done, is that when Russia stopped export of apples and other fruits and vegetables to, to Russia, the cold store created, the sorting lines which we are working on, the ideas of this uh, uh, post-harvest, which was introduced again from California, this idea of post-harvest, in a year we managed to sell much more to European Union fruits and vegetables than to Russia. And Russia realized that this didn't work and they release, release again Moldovan products to go to Russian market. This was very important, very important because we did not get suffocated when we were under this ban. Uh, and many other programs, Farmer to Farmer, which uh, created uh, uh, a great assistance program, private companies, I would say more than 110 uh, uh, been established and helped volunteers program as well. So invested, I think CNFA invested some $8 million in these uh, uh, programs, which uh, changed the Moldovan agriculture. Now, because the time is, uh, I, I, I tell you, I can tell you so many things, so many things, how, how great uh, CNFA worked in Moldova, but uh, agenda is agenda. That's why I would like to <laughs> no, you know, uh, even working a minister, uh, they will teach us that you are not the, the most important. The people responsible for agenda are more important. So <laughs> stop. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to say a few words why this is so important to, to talk today about that. Because it's one thing, so an expert comes to Moldova and say, okay, guys, or to other country in America or Africa and saying, oh, we know how to do this, and we can do this, and we'll have that result. That's good. But it's much better when you take someone and you go and they see that this system worked. Of course, it didn't work immediately because there was many things to do to adjust it to the mentality, to the culture, to the conditions. But this is what this uh, uh, high quali qualified team managed. Uh, your experience on partnership, private and public, now is used very successfully on subsidy system. We are going on and we are promoting our policies through the subsidy system. And it works very well as well. So uh, today I want to tell you 
don't think I'm not modest, but the level of Moldovan agriculture is so close to the European level. Maybe not everywhere, but let's say if a quarter of our agriculture is like European, already means a lot. Of course, I would not say that our agriculture has no problems. I think American agriculture has problems. Of course, I wish I would, would have your problems. But, <laughs> so, but we talk about problems at a different level. It's one thing to have problems at this level. It's another thing to have problems at this level. So the problems we have, they are at a different level. And we would be very happy to have you back in Moldova and look at the problems at the other level. So uh, I would like to congratulate you again to thank you CNFA, to thank everyone who helped Moldova, to thank USAID, MCC, uh, USDA, and all American people, because this used to be American money who helped my country, who helped my people to fight poverty, to stay more at home and no, not to work today in Moscow or in uh, Siberia somewhere, to develop agriculture and uh, Please, CNFA, come back to Moldova. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gail Mitchell, member of the board, and I'm going to be um, moderating this panel. And I just wanted to say that I've only been on the board about six months, and it just is delightful for me. They fulfill a passion. The people here have great expertise, as many of you do as well. And it's so exciting to learn, and I'm still learning, all that they do in the field and all the work that goes behind sending people to the field. Um, it's a privilege to be here and celebrating the 30-year anniversary of CNFA and to help moderate this important discussion around how partnering with the private sector can play a critical role in global agricultural development as well as economic growth. We know that the demand for food across our planet has increased at an unprecedented level and we will likely have two billion more mouths to feed by mid-century over nine billion people. Not only the population increase, um, but we're also becoming globally more prosperous and this is changing the eating habits of people. They're eating richer foods and more foods. So that's increasing the need. We know as an organization what to do and organizations, but we need to figure out how we're going to go about doing it and then doing it right. Everyone in this room recognizes the importance of increasing private sector involvement in agriculture. We know that the enhanced private sector involvement is fundamental to improving agriculture and to ensure that our government food demands are met. So the questions, how do we mobilize more private support to increase agricultural growth? How do we move the existing constraints? We have a very smart agricultural industry and experts joining us today who have the opportunity to discuss these critical issues. I'd like to take just a moment to introduce once again our panelists. We have Dr. Rob Smith with AGCO, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And Rob is going to touch on how mechanization will be instrumental in helping food, helping feed our growing population. Our next speaker is Jay Room, President and CEO of Crop Life America. He will be discussing how we can improve agronomic practices and significantly boost productivity. Oops. And then last, we have Jason Hoffman with Agriculture and Trade Editor for Political Pro. And he's going to provide insights on current policies and its impact on the global agricultural development. Following these three speakers, then we'll be able to field your questions and have some discussions. So these will be short and sweet, and we'll move 10 minutes each before questions and answers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Smith as our first speaker. Thank you, Gail. Good afternoon. 
I'd like to start with a heartfelt congratulations to CNFA for 30 years of truly making a difference. I think the passion that we heard in your story, Vesely, and you mentioned passion, is a very important part of agriculture today. As a matter of fact, it's a strong motivation for my coming to join the agricultural industry two and a half years ago. Our company's vision is high-tech solutions for professional farmers feeding the world. I was this close going to run another automotive company when I had the opportunity to come to agriculture and learned about the passion and learned about the nine billion people and learned about the two billion more people that need to be fed and not just fed but fed well in the next 20 or 30 years. One billion of those two billion people are in Africa. Why is Africa important? Why am I going to talk about Africa today? Why have we been working very hard to develop a, a vision for Africa and to put it in place? Why is it interesting to the private sector? That's actually one of the reasons I came to agriculture. In automotive, 20 years in automotive, agri Africa doesn't play a large role in the automotive industry. I've traveled all over the world, but I've never worked in Africa. And the opportunity to be a part of truly changing the game in Africa was a very strong motivation for coming here. Our vision for Africa is inclusive and sustainable mechanization. Let me start with sustainable. Sustainable means designing products and building products and offering products, machines, agricultural machines in Africa that are tremendously robust, that are simple, straightforward, and easy to operate, and that can be afforded by farmers across the entire spectrum. Not yet mechanized farmers, small holding farmers, and obviously medium and large sized farmers. But having sustainable mechanization means the machines have to work in an extremely robust, or an extremely challenging environment. And the machines must be robust and simple to operate. It means having a distribution network that's able to service those machines. It means putting a significant investment in Johannesburg to supply the entire continent especially the sub-Saharan part, with spare parts for our machines. So a farmer doesn't spend all of his life savings to buy a machine, have it break, and have no parts. That doesn't happen with ours. We're putting another spare parts center just east of Istanbul this year to service Turkey and northern Africa. So we'll have the best parts support on the entire continent. Sustainable also means teaching and training. We've built a Agco Future Farm in Zambia. We bought it ourselves. Agco is a farmer in Africa. We farm that farm. In the center of the farm is a training center where we teach farmers basic <laughs> agronomy, basic farming practices. We teach dealers and mechanics how to operate and operators how to operate, maintain, and support our machines. So you can learn that in the classroom in the training center. You can walk across the hallway into a mechanics bay and see the machines and learn hands-on with the equipment how to operate, service, and maintain. And then you go outside on the model farm where we demonstrate best practice farming practices in Africa as African farmers. There are 60 million farming entities in Africa. 77% of those farming entities are not yet mechanized. They're using, if they're lucky, animals to, plow, to pull the plow. They're using hand planters. 19% of the African farming community is a smallholder. Very basic mechanization, doing a good job and starting to move up the ladder on not only good and successful farming practice, but on the path to prosperity. There's only 400,000 farming entities, less than a million, that are medium and large size. A lot of our competition only focuses there. Agco obviously does a lot of good business in the medium and large farming entities with tremendously high-tech solutions, but that's not inclusive mechanization. We talk sustainable, inclusive means not, leaning, not leaving any farming entity, not leaving any farmer, any farming family behind on the path to agricultural growth and on the path to, to prosperity. A hundred meters by a hundred meters makes up a hectare. You plant corn in rows every 60 centimeters, and the seeds are seven centimeters apart. 
If you're doing that by hand, if you're clearing the land by hand, if you're preparing the land by hand, if you're planting that with a stick, it's a non-winning proposition. It takes weeks just to do the planting. The clearing of the land is back-breaking work. And you're walking in that field barefoot with an ox, if you're lucky, and a hand planter. We did this on our farm with a UK-based agriculture university. We planted one hectare on our model farm where we're demonstrating these farming practices. We planted one hectare of our property. And I would like to stress for a moment, we use top quality seed. We're not talking recycled seed. We're not talking the problems about not having the right seed. On our farm, we went with our partners. We have a seed best practice partner. We have crop care best practice. We have a fertilizing partner with best practice fertilizing. We bring the mechanization and the leadership on the farm. But coming back to this one hectare, that one hectare was planted by hand. Right next to it, we planted a hectare using our basic mechanization package that I'll quickly touch on in a minute or two. The yield on the first hectare was a ton and a half of maize on that hectare. By the way, both of them used best, best seeds, fresh seed, used the same fertilizer, best practice fertilization, and was, and was exposed to the same growing season. Of course, if it takes you two weeks or more to just plant the hectare, you're optimal, you've missed the optimal planting window, and the amount of time before it's time to harvest is a lot shorter than if you've been able to put the, plant, put the, put the seed in the ground in a, it, the right window of time up front. We planted the second hectare using our basic mechanization package. The yield on the first hectare was a ton and a half. The yield on the second hectare, directly adjacent to it, subject to the same climatic conditions, the same seed, the same fertilizer, was 5.2 tons. That's more than a 300% difference. Why is AGCO, why is the private sector involved in Africa, involved in mechanization? What I very much appreciate about CNFA's approach, what I appreciate about our approach, it's not charity. It's a medium-term business case that's a winning business case for all the entities involved. And it's focused on making it a winning opportunity for that farming family. The difference between 5.2 and one ton and a half times 200 to $250, depending on where is the commodity price at the moment that farmer sells, is driving a business case. We've developed a business case for the small smallholder farmer. Calculating input costs, calculating all the costs that that farmer needs to take into account. We've just developed over this past year, and we'll be launching in February, a basic mechanization package that will be a groundbreaking mechanization package for the market in Africa. It will be the most affordable, best new package for an emerging farmer that's ever been on the continent by actually a very significant, by a very significant delta. We'll be offering a 50 horsepower tractor with five implements, a, rip, a, a ripper, a disc harrow, a plow. Very importantly, that two-row that two planter that we use to, to plant the seed. It took us less than an afternoon to plant the hectare on it with a mechanized approach. That was exposed to the full growing season, and that's what was part of making the 5.2 tons of yield. Mechanization is what makes the difference between being working hand to mouth and having a sustainable farming practice. So the business case that we have built, that we're sharing with smallholder farmers, that they can then take to partners like CNFA, to partners like their local dealer, to partners like Standard Bank, to partners like where they can get some financing assistance, is a business case that demonstrates that they can buy this with farming pack. Five farmers with five hectares apiece inside of three years can purchase this basic mechanization package, pay it back inside of three years, and take their family from hand-to-mouth existence living below the poverty level to having an income that's better than the average national working income in the country. And it makes it attractive for the women farmers. It makes it attractive for youth to come back to the farm or not leave the farm. It's inclusive and it's sustainable mechanization. In February, we're targeting the 1st of February, the uh, Corporate Council for Africa is hosting a very significant uh, summit in Addis Ababa at the, hopefully, the African Union building. And we're working to launch our emerging package on the steps of the African Union building on the 1st of February with a 1,000 or more 
participants in this conference coming from all over the continent and from all over the world because we want to share this news in Africa and we want to make it clearly an opportunity for sustainable and inclusive mechanization and bring in smallholders and not yet mechanized farmers under this path of prosperity. For less than $20,000, you can put all that together in a package. It's the most competitive thing in the entire continent, in the entire continent, and it will change the game for agriculture now. It's good. The focus is on making it good for the farming, for the very first time farmer, making it good for the farming entities. And each person in the short supply chain is also making it a winning proposition. So it's sustainable for private industry to be making this happen. So we're very proud of that. We're excited about it. If there's some things to talk about later, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Very interesting, and I look forward to some questions about that when we're done. Would you like to help us understand um, agronomic practices? I will try. Okay. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jay Vroom. I'm uh, president of CropLife America, and I do have some slides. If I could get the first slide up, please. That would not be it. <laughs> At any rate, um, Mr. Minister, thank you for your remarks uh, about the commitment uh, that CNFA have delivered, but also acknowledging that the commitment of Americans and American taxpayers, but also American farmers to helping to support with not only our resources, but our hearts and our minds, the commitment to help farmers everywhere. Uh, a lot of people would raise question about why would American farmers want to help other farmers produce more? And the answer is simple. We've learned this lesson, uh, I think the easy way, and it is because as other farmers get better at their craft around the world, they move out of subsistence into more modern farming systems, just as you have described, and, and Rob, as you described, the work that AGCO is doing in Africa. And it's bringing forward an opportunity for them to be competitors, but also customers. And so uh, Secretary Block, uh, being a hog farmer in Illinois, uh, understands all too well that we have the opportunity to export great uh, swine genetics around the world and perhaps to Moldova and create trade opportunities and perhaps as you grow your livestock sector one day you'll be importing feed grains and oil seeds from us here in America or our Brazilian counterparts. The comparative advantage opportunities that flow from decades of investment in development and making agriculture better is a tide that lifts all of our boats. So thank you for that uh, recognition. I'm uh, here as a representative of the crop protection and crop biotechnology industry at Crop Life America, but I'm really here as an exiled farmer from Illinois, corn farmer. <laughs> uh, and by the way, Mr. Minister, I thought you were about to tell us that uh, John Costello was in intelligence, central intelligence, <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, he's been committed to his career in decentralized intelligence dispersing information, and doing the good work that CNFA has always stood for. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Tom Campbell, who is here in the audience today. Tom uh, recently retired from uh, CNFA and uh, was, before that, uh, career-long with Dow AgroSciences and one of those leaders for our industry that helped Crop Life and all of our members understand the opportunity and value proposition, John, uh, that uh, we've been engaged with you and CNFA around from the crop protection and crop biotech sectors uh, for all these years. So uh, Crop Life America is the principal trade association representing our industry here in the United States. Uh, we're also networked around the world in 90 different associations uh, through our global federation. Uh, and I'd like to also acknowledge my colleague from Crop Life Australia, Matthew Cossey, who is here today representative of Crop Life Asia that is doing a lot of the same kind of development work uh, that we're here to talk about here today. So congratulations certainly to CNFA, uh, a bright future uh, as we have referred based on 30 years of wonderful history. Uh, for 25 years we've had many direct projects between the crop protection industry and CNFA, lots of indirect engagements. Today I'd like to address four principal topics. The value of farmer demonstrations, and Rob, you talked about that from a mechanization standpoint. 
We've got several from a crop protection and improved seed standpoint. And to emphasize the importance of those final words of Dr. Norman Borlaug, take it to the farmer. Dr. Borlaug was an emeritus uh, member of the board of directors of our foundation at Crop Life, and his granddaughter Julie is now newly elected to our foundation board of directors. And I think all of us and the work that we do really are charged with the obligation of picking up that vision of Dr. Borlaug and that green revolution and carrying it forward into the future. I'd like to talk a little bit about anti-counterfeit work, uh, safe use education, and finally wrap up with a few notes about the importance of regulatory capacity building in the developing world. So about 10 years ago, uh, we looked at uh, a number of facts around the world and what we could do in collaboration with organizations like CNFA to take uh, demonstration information to farmers in the developing world. And because of the agri-dealer ne uh, network uh, that CNFA already had in Africa, uh, we partnered up. Uh, we recognized that there were opportunities to improve yields and also reduce drudgery of hand weeding if we could show African farmers the opportunity to use improved herbicides to do all of those opportunities. Uh, we knew that uh, everybody understands from an agronomic standpoint, Gail, that uh, farmers need to plant at the right time, weed at the right time, and fertilize at the right time. And that's a combination of all of those factors along with mechanization. So we started to study this problem in Africa and identified uh, a lot of the same agronomic facts that we know around the world, that weeds are a serious problem. Uh, soils contain 100 to 300 million weed seeds per hectare. Unweeded plots can produce uh, 25 tons of weeds per hectare, obviously choking out uh, the competitive crops. Seeds uh, won't prosper if they're competing with weeds. We also identified the fact that weeding needs to occur before a plant a crop is planted and then during the growing season because weeds come along and they want to compete with that crop. Uh, we looked at and found lots of great information about uh, how much time a farmer would spend hand weeding and estimated at that time about 10 years ago that it would be 20 billion hours yearly spent on hand weeding across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, to weed one hectare, a woman would have to walk 10 kilometers in a stoop position to accomplish that weed removal and uh, to free the crop from that threat. Child labor is also a factor, uh, also employed in hand weeding. And non-cultivated land uh, is also undeveloped because we can't get the weeds under control to even get a crop started in many cases. So achieving optimum yields through traditional hand weeding obviously have lots and lots of problems. Uh, the option of using chemical herbicides across Africa in a broader, more inclusive way uh, offers time savings. Uh, it is more adaptable and certainly more effective. We also determined 10 years ago that uh, around 3% of African smallholder farmers were using any herbicides in their maize fields. So fast forward about three years later, uh, we were on the ground with CNFA and the Agri-Dealer Network. Uh, with the support of about five crop life member companies who donated herbicide technologies for demonstration plots in the countries of Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi. And uh, we got on with this, uh, and immediately the first year had great uh, visual results in side by side trials showing untreated and hand weeded seed uh, fields alongside of crops where herbicides had been effectively and safely applied. The herbicide demonstration plots uh, between 2008 and 2010 in those three countries were supported and possible only because of 50 of the agri-dealer locations in the CNFA network. Crop Life member companies were providing the products, the technical and financial support. We got over 3,000 farmers that visited the demonstration trial plots. Uh, great information uh, added to the uh, instructional manuals for the agri-dealers on how to advise farmers on applying fertili uh, well, fertilizers as well as pesticide products and the herbicides. And we helped to train the applicators uh, through the agri-dealer network. We also brought across to Africa from the United States weed science experts. And we identified very quickly that there was a real 
lack of capacity with regard to trained agronomists with expertise in identifying weeds. If you use the wrong herbicide on the right weed, the right weed doesn't mind because it will continue on. So knowing what weeds you're trying to treat, understanding all the other agronomic conditions were very important. So we were able to bring people like uh, Dr. Phil Stallman from Kansas State University as a volunteer instructor who came and worked with the agri-dealers in Malawi to help uh, build up some capacity with regard to better weed identification and treatment. The net result were substantial improvement of women's lives where herbicides began to be used with less drudgery, fewer back problems, time for children to go to school, and so many other benefits uh, from the agronomic outcomes as well. Uh, training for safe use is important, and again, the CNFA network and our other cooperators and collaborators were able to fulfill and carry forward with that delivery of safe use training as well. So we got lots of great results and uh, I think started something very significant. Pivoting to the second topic, uh, we know that uh, there are lots of counterfeit goods, whether it's watches or apparel or athletic shoes around the world. And certainly in, in the world of pharmaceuticals and pesticides, there are lots of counterfeiters out there. Uh, we've done a recent survey and as of 2012, uh, identified that in Western Africa, 40 to 60 percent of the pesticide products offered in the agricultural marketplace are counterfeit goods. We have a global endeavor underway uh, driven by CropLife International, our global federation, to educate governments, uh, to work with customs officials, to work with uh, shipping companies, to get advocacy and awareness uh, driven out there so that people can understand that this is a serious problem and one that we want to help to try to prevent. Uh, recently, one important uh, African nation uh, had to suspend exports to Europe because it was discovered that counterfeit, counterfeit pesticides were prevalent uh, in that country and would not be acceptable if those residues were detected on exports for cash sale into the European market of crops grown by the farmers in that country. Uh, the country got ahead of this. Uh, our industry collaborated through CropLife Africa Middle East and we solved the problem, but it's a great example of how mm -hmm. there are downside uh, worries to the counterfeit goods problem that uh, certainly is prevalent in our industry. And Rob, I'm sure you have counterfeit uh, parts problems in the farm machinery sector. So safe use training, uh, pivoting back to that, uh, we've, through several African countries, developed a spray service providers concept where we are doing extensive training through our colleagues in CropLife Africa uh, for people who are dedicated to either full-time or, or part-time occupations as spray operators. And this has proved to be quite a success. That SSP concept is much more than training. It links to, again, those professional agri-dealers that are on the ground, backing them up or sometimes providing the service themselves. So we're promoting safe use. Uh, we acknowledge that our products uh, can be dangerous if they're not used properly with personal uh, protective equipment and proper sprayer calibrations. And we want to do that part of stewardship right along with being there advancing agriculture. Finally, uh, none of this works if governments don't have a science-based regulatory system in place to assure that our products are well regulated, they're understood by governments, and once again, uh, we and everyone in the NGO community, we believe, have an obligation to support regulatory capacity in these developing countries. And what that supports is the advancement of innovation. And I'll close with just a few notes about uh, our industry's biotechnology traits offering. So in 2008, just a handful of years ago, in the entirety of the world, we only had about 33 agronomic traits, biotechnology-based traits uh, commercialized. Today, we're almost 100 greater than that around the world. You can see the advancements in parts of the developing world uh, where we're making a really great difference. Uh, obviously, we have a big disagreement with Fortress Europe over the concept of biotechnology-improved crops. We're working to try to find a way through those uh, disagreements and bring science to the fore of gaining greater public acceptance 
so that uh, these technologies as well can not only make it to the farmer, but also benefit consumers. Uh, this is just uh, one slide that gives you a, a cross-section of a few of the new traits that are coming for the benefit of African farmers. And some of the traits, like those for the cow pea, are actually being donated by our member companies uh, as gifts to the farmers in those countries to advance crops that aren't necessarily in international commerce but can be advanced for the benefit of the local consumers. So uh, we've got a lot more to offer. Uh, the innovation pipeline of our industry is absolutely amazing. And I look forward to having a great conversation with you uh, at the end of our panel discussion about uh, our role in advancing agronomic uh, productivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. And now Jason's going to talk to us about uh, current policies and the impact on agricultural development. Hi. Uh, just like the rest of the panel, I want to say how honored I am to be involved in this uh, celebration of CNFA. Uh, I am a father of, of two young, lovely ladies, and I can tell you when you watch your uh, children grow up, you have a, you know, a couple goals, and you hope that they grow up and they're um, independent and confident and able to run on their own. And um, John, uh, after 30 years, I think your child looks great. <laughs> so uh, congratulations. Um, as the editor of uh, Politico Pro Agriculture and Trade, I tend to focus on, or we tend to focus on, um, U.S. policy and how it affects U.S. industry, U.S. F uh, agriculture. Um, and it's not common that we go and look at other countries and how the U.S. policy affects those. So this was a, a, a terrific uh, journey for me to get into this and, and to do some research in this area. Um, I have a great group of reporters. I have uh, uh, seven reporters and a deputy editor who are experts on, the, on, on these subjects, and I use them a lot to help me uh, sort of better understand what, what was happening. And then, and then I, I called a lot of people who are, uh, who are recommended in, the, um, in this area who, uh, who are now my friends, they're my best friends. Um, so uh, anyhow, some of the things that we would normally write about uh, would be this, the Farm Bill. Um, it is, and I, that's Matt Worker's cartoon, by the way. Matt Worker is, uh, is a blessed cartoonist for Politico. Um, we bring people into the, uh, the conference room where his work hangs, and they stop and stare uh, for a couple minutes. But um, it's politics, and it's, and it's full of conflict and, um, and uh, you know, kind of strange developments. Um, but I can't say that that's, you know, that's not the case Anytime you get into any any kind of a situation like this, um, among the issues that I that I got into, I, I went out there and I tried to find the issues that would matter the most to this group, and um, and one of the first issues that I got into was the uh, Global Food Food Security Act. Um, if probably most of you are familiar with Feed the Future, the program uh, started by the Obama administration in uh, 2010, um, in response to the food price uh, hikes from 2007 and 2008 and, and the unrest that was causing across the world. Um, You'll, you've probably heard these numbers, but by 2050, the world's uh, population is, is projected to increase by more than 9 billion. And to increase, to meet the demands of this growing population, we're going to have to increase agricultural production by at least 60%. So the Obama administration, they promised to spend about $3 billion over the next three years to help fund this Feed the Future program. Um, and, as, and if you're familiar with the program, you know it involves 11 different uh, federal agencies, and there are about 19 focused countries that, that it goes after. The legislation, the Global Food Security Act, has been batted around almost since the beginning of the program and has not yet been passed. Um, but I think we're pretty close to having some action uh, uh, in, in Congress on that. Um, a bill was uh, put forth by Representative Chris Smith in the House Foreign Affairs Committee back in March, and uh, another bill by Senator Robert Casey in May in the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and this essentially, the bills would essentially provide more congressional oversight over the program. Um, I'm told that depending on who you talk to and how fast these bills are going to move, uh, you get different projections. Um, I actually talked to a press person in uh, Senator Casey's office and heard of months, and then I talked to some people uh, around in the sort of the advocacy groups, and they said weeks 
Uh, they think they're going to have action in weeks. The House bill actually has 91 bipartisan co-sponsors. The Senate bill has 10. So it's in, it's in a good shot, good, good position to, to move. Um, I asked the press person at Casey's office who was opposed to this legislation and why do, what issues do they have with it. And, um, and he said, really, no one. Um, so if anybody in the audience is aware of something that might stop this legislation from moving, please inform me. I'm curious. Um, Katie Lee, a policy manager at Interaction and a former member, member of Senator Luger's staff who put this bill forward a couple of years ago, wrote an article for the Huffington Post where she identified the five reasons to pay attention to the legislation. And I'm not going to go through all five, but um, I'll give you a couple that were kind of interesting. She said, uh, the GFSA will codify the whole of government strategy because there are all these agencies involved. Um, it will ensure that there's existing coordination between the key agencies. Um, it will focus the program on a concept that you, many of you are familiar with, uh, on the first, uh, uh, getting nutrition to children in the first thousand days of life, uh, which it, it plays a key role in um, development. Um, and uh, another big one, two, two more big ones, it would um, establish congressional oversight and reporting requirements, uh, and it would promote country ownership and sustainability. That, those are some of the concepts that are behind the bill. Um, so I, I would say that's a good thing to pay attention to. Another issue I, I was interested in that I got into, uh, and I know CNFA has an interest in it, is uh, in the trade area, uh, the, uh, Cuba. Um, we are been, we've been focusing a ton of uh, our attention on the TPP deal, which is, uh, you know, is moving. It's, it's, it's running into some friction, uh, and, it, and it's a huge mega trade deal. But Cuba actually is kind of an interesting um, uh, trade situation. I don't know if you caught the news today, but... The UN just had another vote uh, uh, this morning on uh, whether to condemn the US embargo uh, of Cuba. The Cubans call it the blockade. Um, and everybody was curious to see what the US would do in this situation because now they're trying, you know, the Obama administration's been making movements towards uh, easing the relationship with Cuba. And the US again voted against the condemnation. Uh, so it was kind of a curious development. One other country did that, and that was Israel. The UN voted 191 to 2 against um, the embargo. Um, there, are, I, uh, there are tremendous opportunities in Cuba, and to kind of get at that, uh, I read an article that was really interesting by Stephen Sonheiser and USDA's Economic Research Service, and what he did was he went back to the, the 1950s, pre-revolution, and looked at U.S. ag exports to Cuba and uh, um, Cuba exports to the U.S., and what, what how much money was wrapped up in that and what kind of crops were involved in that. It was really interesting. Um, the, at the time, the U.S. A exported about $139 million per year to Cuba, and the U.S. Uh, took in about $408 million worth of Cuban products. Um, so it, it was big business for Cuba back then. Um, products like uh, that came from Cuba to the U.S. would be like cane sugar, molasses, tobacco, and coffee. They, uh, at the time the amount of sugar that we took from Cuba, uh, 2.8 million metric tons, is pretty close apparently to what we take in total today, 3 million tons from all nations in sugar. So uh, there is an opportunity if Cuba were ever to be able to send agricultural goods back to the U.S. Um, I asked Stephen what uh, would be needed for the U.S. to help Cuba better develop its agriculture, um, and he said, for the ability to have U.S. officials, USDA officials in particular, travel to Cuba to be able to provide advice to the uh, Cubans, would be a, uh, which is not happening right now, would be a, a big boom. I know that CNFA has an interest in Cuba and is uh, very active in, in pushing the program. I, I would love to hear more about the latest and, and, and how that's going, um, if, if, if you have a minute, maybe during the Q&A. Um, but uh, on, the, on the downside, uh, improving trade with Cuba is a long way off. Um, I read an article also by John Magnus, who's uh, president of a law firm, Trade Winds, and he talked about the number of different laws, at least eight laws, that would have to change for uh, trade relations to, to improve with Cuba. Um, the Foreign Assistance Act, the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enforcement Act, the Food Security Act, there are a number of different laws that, that stand in the way, so a lot will have to happen for us to make a lot of progress with Cuba, but, you know, and, I, and, and um, if you hear me say something political one way or the other, 
I don't take sides, but uh, just so you know, just to clarify. Um, but um, it will be interesting to see if that develops, if that happens. Um, I think this is an exciting time. Uh, another topic that I thought I'd touch on briefly uh, is um, uh, climate change. Uh, it's interesting. I talked to the Chicago Council of Global Affairs about this and, um, and also the uh, uh, Action Aid, which is a group that's not a big fan of ethanol. Um, the... the uh, one of the things I heard about uh, renewable fuel, the renewable fuel standards in the U.S. is that it drives, it, it has such an impact in the U.S., and it's very controversial in the U.S., but it also apparently drives the, the, uh, the price of crops in other countries that are used to make biofuels. And as a result, countries like Brazil and Guatemala uh, grow a lot of um, uh, biofuel crops. Um, now, a final rule is coming in the next uh, month from EPA on the RFS, and a lot of people are watching to see what happens there. You're going to see a lot of uh, action in, in Washington on that. Um, I just noticed, by the way, today that the USDA continuing to push the Renewable Fuel Standards Program announced a one-to-one -one matching federal grant with Florida. Um, they say that will bring the renewable energy investment up to $38 million. Uh, so there is money being spent in this area. Um, the last area I'll, I'll touch on uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions or have the audience engage, uh, is on GMO policies. Um, I was curious to see how U.S. GMO policies uh, impact agriculture in other countries, and so I started calling a lot of folks. Um, I talked to Matt O'Mara, who is the managing director at Bio and specializes in international affairs, and I asked him which U.S. policies in relation to GMOs uh, did he think had, a, had an impact on this area? And I was surprised because he mentioned one I thought was surely off the list. And he said GMO labeling. Um, if you're familiar with what's going on with GMO labeling, uh, uh, several states have moved towards trying to pass laws that require <coughs> labels on food products if they contain genetically engineered ingredients. Vermont actually succeeded in passing the law. It's now being contested in the courts. Simultaneously, uh, there is a, uh, a movement in Congress, uh, a legislation that would make the federal government sort of the final arbitrator of uh, whether food requires to have a label on it if it's got GMOs in it. Um, and I said, Matt, how does that have anything to do with the use of GMOs in other countries? And he said, it's like this, Jason. Um, uh, Europe puts off a very strong message about biotechnology, and it's not necessarily a positive one. Um, the U.S. is counted on to be a confident uh, uh, promoter of, 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 of biotechnology, uh, you know, a, a pillar of the, of the technology. If we are squabbling in the U.S. about whether GMOs are safe or not, it makes it difficult for other countries, more difficult for other countries to embrace the technology, especially with Europe being a loud voice over on the other side. Um, but he did say one thing that I thought was kind of interesting. He said that um, one of the developments in the future that will could persuade could persuade other countries. Um, China is moving very strongly into uh, the GMO area, and um, and their uh, their position on GMOs could actually serve as another sort of a pillar in the international community that's pro-GMO. We have our issues with China and GMOs. Uh, getting them to accept U.S. Uh, GMOs is not a, a, an easy thing, but um, but I thought that was an interesting comment. Um, Anyhow, that's, that's pretty much all I have to offer. Uh, I'm sorry if I rambled around a bunch of different topics, but I would love to hear from the audience uh, and uh, what they care about, what they think is going on that they want to talk about. Thank you, Jason. So now it's time to hear from you. And uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Someone will come to you with a microphone. And you can stand up and direct your question to one of these panelists, please. My question is for Agco. Uh, Africa, especially on, with the maize crop, the, their biggest problem is storage. Have you ever thought of uh, adding a storage component to your program there? I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I am uh, here today. A colleague of mine was going to be here today. And he's quite welcome. Our GSI grain storage unit. 
Echo has a business in grain storage and poultry care. As a matter of fact, thank you. We have a grain storage business. This model farm that I described, on the model farm, we have, uh, we demonstrate a grain drying and a grain storage silo. And we've been working this past year on a program with USAID uh, called Bags to Bulk. Because as you well know, most of the many, many losses, once you get a small yield, even 30, 40, 50% of that yield is lost in what's called post-harvest losses. Most of the grain in Sub-Saharan Africa is stored after it's harvested in, in used plastic sacks. Rats get to it, the grain rots, and you lose half of the, of the paltry yield that was, or the, of the harvest that was made in the first place. So we have put in place and are working actively on the continent, uh, demonstrating best practice grain drying in storage facilities, and are doing so that communities have uh, access to those storage facilities for exactly the reasons you're you're, you're asking. Uh, there's a bit of heat and it's a good amount of air. Okay. It helps, it helps clearly to uh, the, a bit of heat is, is good. Too much heat is not, but uh, yeah. it, it uh, accelerates the drying and uh, depending on the distance and the size of the silo, it helps get it in the silo in the right condition and the right uh, the right amount of uh, uh, water content. Yeah, okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, SNFA, uh, for inviting the uh, uh, Institute for Economic Growth and Legal Reform. Uh, we congratulate uh, uh, your uh, achievement over a generation. Um, my name is Johannes Kasson. I'm the director of uh, uh, iGrow, in short, the uh, Institute for Economic Growth and Legal Reform. My question uh, for Dr. Vasili and Dr. Roy, uh, you stated very uh, interesting uh, note that countries have land, but they don't give to people, their own people. Very strong statement, and we are facing this several countries where we are trying to, to work, and the private sector, one of the reasons that many governments are giving us is that there will be a large number of farmers who will be left behind, who will be uh, reduced to even more poverty while a few would be growing into a prosperous life. And therefore, we are trying to make sure that small farmers will be still having their own land and farming and assist them in improving their lives equally with others. In Moldova, did you have any such a problem? And if you had, what type of regulations, laws, policies were in place to avoid these problems? If you can uh, just elaborate a little bit on that. And Dr. Roy, Rob, uh, very interesting, very interesting concept on uh, the, one of the, the inclusive approaches that you have as an as, as, uh, organization. Um, definitely, uh, you, have, you have, especially in Africa, you have, you have seen that the small producer mechanization, uh, very interesting, but still I have some problem with your statistics when you say, a small package of about $40,000 can make I mean, a small group wonderful. But I, are we talking about the 400,000 uh, farmers? Are we talking that this package could be uh, done for still smaller uh, farmers? Did you, you, is your organization thinking, or has, have you just thought some innovations for local production of such mechanization in Africa. Thank you. Okay. I, I think I will stand up because this is really a very important issue to discuss. Of course, we don't have so much time to talk about that, 
But um, in, uh, immediately after the independence in 1991, we had a kind of land privatization in our country. Uh, people used to have some shares and so on and so on. But as long as the farmer or the, the citizen of Moldova did not feel that this is his piece of land, nothing happened. We even uh, went in bigger troubles. So there was needed a real land privatization. And we could not afford that because this is very, very expensive. Every citizen was supposed to get his piece of land. Not just theoretically, on paper, with clear borders, with clear area, with clear place. Today is much easier because the GPS helps much more. But at that time it was more difficult. But due to the assistance from the United States, it's about $50 million program. But this was what gave a huge kick to develop our high-value agriculture. Yeah, you're right. Some of the farmers are getting the land. They don't know what to do and how to, to, to manage it. But it should be just at the beginning. Everybody got its piece of land. This helped us to create land market. Land market, again, is very important. Now, no, if you want to be competitive, this is very important because in our country, the idea, we, we, we've been talking about market economy a lot. But to us at that time, market was the bazaar where they can sell some tomatoes. And that was the market. But we, when we talk now about market, we mean something different. And to be competitive in the, not local, but international market, because my country has no other resources than agriculture, and we must export. Otherwise, we cannot buy inputs. We import 100% of fuel, 100% of fertilizer, 90% of machinery. How to survive? Of course, we get some money from our people working abroad, but this is not enough. We need exports. To export, you must be competitive. To be competitive, you have to plant a competitive orchard. And a competitive orchard costs a lot of money. And who can dare to plant an orchard or such expensive on somebody's land or, or on the land which no, nobody knows whom it belongs to? But this person wants to leave this land to his son, to his daughter, and so on and so on. And it is a little bit painful, but the market changes situation. Who can do does, who cannot has to sell it or rent it and do something else because you cannot uh, keep all the people in the country farming all their life. There, there should be some other things to do. And we had programs. And CNFA was involved in uh, creating other jobs in the, in the countryside to, to, to give people uh, a chance. Because uh, working on one hectare of land in Moldova, this is painful and not profitable. So uh, without land market, uh, it doesn't work. So we have a very good example that it works. And you say about small farmers, I said the example of Russia. They can give such a share that nobody can even imagine, but they don't do, do it. And their agriculture, I can't remember to be performant ever. So this is what I can say briefly. If this is briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I quickly touch the second question first. Do we produce locally in Africa? Yes. ECO has the only vertically integrated tractor factory on the continent. As a matter of fact, we have a joint venture in Algeria called the Algerian Tractor Company. We started three years ago. We signed the joint venture in April. Between Christmas and New Year's, we produced the first Massey Ferguson in the factory. The following year, we made 1,000. Last year, we made just over 2,000. This year, we'll make a little over 2,000, 2,100 and so. And over time, we expect to reach uh, about 5,000 locally produced Massey Ferguson's in Africa. Maybe a quick correction. Uh, it's not $40,000. It's $20,000. And just below that, that's comprised of a 50 horsepower Massey Ferguson tractor that we'll be selling for just below $10,000. And for additional $10,000, five implements, a ripper, a disc harrow, a plow. Very importantly, the two-row planter, and very importantly, a box or a trailer, so the farmer cannot just be planting and, and working his land. He can have a transportation uh, business as well. So it's important to have the, those imp that package together, the machine, the tractor, and the five implements, just below 20,000. It's addressing explicitly the 59,600,000 farming entities on the continent 
that are subsistence farmers not yet mechanized and emerging farmers that are just barely mechanized. That's why I'm talking about inclusive mechanization. We're very focused on bringing a quality of life to the women farmer, to getting youth involved in farming because it's a sustainable business. It's not sexy walking in the field barefoot with an ox and a hand planter. It's very exciting to be, as a family, in a position to feed your own children, as a community to feed your, as a, as a, as a farmer in a community to feed that community. The ag leaders in Africa are very focused on being able to support their own populations without imports. And it must be that in the next 30 years, Africa goes from a net importer to a ex net exporter to feed 9 billion people worldwide and 2 billion people in Africa very quickly. A small story, when I shared our Africa strategy with ECO's board of directors in April of this year, or in July of this year, as a matter of fact, we talked about inclusive sustainable mechanization. It was very, very important to them that we were doing this. And I shared how Massey, for, ECO is 25 years old this year. Well, we go back to the 1880s with our global brand, Massey Ferguson. Massey Ferguson's been in Africa longer than Coca-Cola. Matter of fact, in Ethiopia, the most uh, commonly traded banknote is a 10 burr banknote. And I shared this with our board of directors. And on the back of the 10 burr bank, bear banknote is an old Massey Ferguson Model 240. <laughs> demonstrating that there's a real distinction or a direct uh, connection between what's perceived as a route to prosperity and mechanization, especially in Ethiopia. The funny story is, at the same time I shared that, one of our board of directors members uh, from Brazil had just been in Cuba, and he pulled a banknote out of his pocket, and he said, here's a Cuban banknote. And I turned it over, and on the back of the Cuban banknote was a, was a, was a T-54 Soviet tank. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Kalashnikov. Uh, just one important thing I forgot to say. Here we have Vince Morabito, he was the manager of land program in Moldova. And today he is a legendary person in my country as well as CNFA is a legendary organization. So what they've done, uh, uh, it's a legend. And uh, you can ask more questions and they will tell you more about this, uh, who is interested in land privatization. Thank you. Thank you. Got a question in the back? Yes, thanks very much. First of all, I want to thank the speakers and the panelists for a really great presentation. Uh, my question is for Jason. Um, as we've heard today, the U.S. enterprises and U.S. farmers have a great deal to offer in terms of technology and innovation um, in helping other countries around the world improve their productivity and uh, build stronger value chains in the agriculture sector. If you can think about what U.S. policies are and U.S. regulatory framework is, uh, that might impact the ability for U.S. enterprises and U.S. businesses to really go outside the borders and thrive in this international market and deliver their technology. Do you see that there are any, any changes or any, any areas that are getting overlooked by the government that might impede their ability to do that in terms of the regulatory framework? Or do you see it just strictly as a matter of investment? In other words, can the U.S. government become a stronger and more proactive partner in helping to get some of this U.S. technology in the hands of those who need it globally? Um, I guess I can answer that question in kind of a, a roundabout way. Uh, it's funny, uh, I was talking to another uh, ag reporter about this uh, presentation and, and how interesting it was to get into the subject, and we were kind of confiding in each other that we weren't really looking at agriculture this way, and most agriculture in, in the U.S. are not. There's not a lot of attention being given to it by the press um, in the U.S., and as a result, um, you know, uh, Washington kind of responds to uh, high profile, uh, uh, you know, uh, of noise they, when, they, when they hear things about uh, what's going on. Um, I think the one thing that you could probably uh, uh, do to kind of promote this kind of activity is. Um, uh, the USDA and the ag committees are very much interested in promoting U.S. agriculture. And if you can make it clear uh, that this is a, uh, a business opportunity for U.S. agriculture, then I think you would have more luck promoting programs that do this kind of a thing. Um, and, but we spent a lot of time circling around the, the other issues. But if you can make this clear that it's a, uh, you know, a, a big opportunity for U.S. businesses and agriculture, I think, yeah, you can, you can, you can make some progress here. 
Could I offer a perspective on that? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of our crop life member companies has for many years opted to produce uh, chrysanthemum based uh, natural insecticides, pyrethrums, uh, from production of those flowers from smallholder farmers in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. And for a number of years, we've been working with them, approaching USAID, to see if we couldn't uh, find a way for some USAID support for expansion of additional resources for those farmers so they could expand the pyrethrum flower production. And uh, USAID's answer so far has been, no, it doesn't feed, fit the Feed the Future initiative, which has to be all food. And this is producing an industrial product. And we've said, yes, but it's an industrial product intended to be used by farmers, not only in Africa, but in Europe and the United States, to expand food production. And it will create cash income for these smallholder farmers in these three African nations that will allow them to improve their agronomic practices on their other land and improve food production at the same time. So it's a, a policy disconnect that may be small in the overall scheme of things in terms of USAID spend, but a great example of a place where just because the book says that the connections aren't there, uh, we can't get there. And I think we could make that kind of policy change. Thank you. Elliot, there's a question in the third row here. Thank you. Um, first of all, I congratulate CNFA on their uh, 30th year anniversary, and thank you, panelists. My question is, all of you have talked about improving subsistence farming and working with smallholder farmers. And smallholder farmers work with crops and livestock. So it's an integrated agriculture. And I didn't hear any of you mentioning about whether it is inclusive mechanization, that inclusive would include livestock as well or not. I, I just wanted to hear your perspective on that. Thank you. Uh, that's really an important issue because when uh, our people got their share of land, there was no chance one could buy even a massive Ferguson 240 at that time. So uh, what we've done in this transitional period, we have organized service centers. So where we, and uh, CNFA, by the way, contributed together with PFAP program to create these service centers where the, the former uh, agronomists or engineers in the big coal hoses could administrate them and give service to the small farmers. And I want to tell you how this worked. Before we started to do that, to pay for a hectare of harvest of a hectare of wheat used to be 25%. So if you have four tons per hectare, one ton, you had to pay to the few guys which were doing services. When we developed this network of service centers, the payment dropped to 11%, which helped so much everyone in the country. And we have many more other examples than spraying, uh, using the sprayers and other work on plant protection and so on and so on, which small farmers cannot handle, nor financially, nor professionally. Thank you. Part of, the, part, of the, part of the training center in Zambia is demonstrating very specifically uh, uh, poultry. It's, it's a protein care, so poultry and swine. And we're showing best practices on, especially in very difficult and warm climates, uh, raising poultry successfully. And we're teaching that to, to farmers in Africa. Thank you. Uh, I'm not part of the speakers, but I would like to <laughs> thank you very much, Marta. Marta is from FR International for your question about livestock. Livestock is critical for food security. The demand for animal food uh, protein is increasing by 3 to 5% per year in Africa. What is the first reflex of people, small order, when they graduate from the poorest class to the middle class? Improve their diets. And what we are talking about here, more eggs, more milk, more, more, uh, more meat. And mechanization is part of that. 
for each production absolutely crucial for improving animal productivity. Crop protection products, exactly the same thing. And we can extend with, with forage improved seed varieties as well. Livestock is also critical in terms of food security, uh, in terms of uh, emergency. We are talking about small ruminants, sheep and goats, for instance. What happens when we have an emergency at the small order also level? Well, we will sell a, a goat and we'll have immediate cash to buy food or to, to get medicine. So I would like to thank you very much for your question. It's part of the main challenge of improving global food security to the engagement of the private sector industry. Thank you. And we'll have one last question in the back. Yes. Peter Levine with Apt Associates. Firstly, let me congratulate CNFA on 30 years and Sylvain for his new appointment, much deserved. I recently returned from Ukraine and the minister's comments uh, resonate with me in some ways. It's a country that's looking towards an FTA with Europe in January. It's got a conflict in the East. It's grappling with its own relations with, uh, with Mother Russia and has a series of legal and other issues to do with the sale of land, the use of biotech, and related uh, items, and it's, it's trying to turn the corner. So I guess I would ask the minister for his advice or reflections, lessons learned at, to his colleagues in Ukraine as to how they might move forward and be successful in that environment. And perhaps secondarily, Jason, any perspective on U.S. policy or um, considerations in that broader geopolitical context? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, Ukraine is our neighbor, and we know very well what's going on in there. And uh, in Ukraine, agriculture is, in, is developing. The only difference is that Moldova is a much smaller country, and for CNFA, for USAID, and other organizations, it was much easier to, to help, to, to, to promote strategies, because in a small country, uh, you know, it's much easier to push the government to, to convince, uh, you know, the, 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 the players in, the, in that. As for the Ukraine, Ukraine is a huge country, and, uh, and they have a very uh, large uh, fields for agriculture. It is developing, and if they will uh, uh, go on, uh, of course, this problem they have in the east and uh, uh, in Crimea, this is a, a big problem for Ukraine. But uh, when we, you know, we used to negotiate together with Ukraine this free trade agreement with the EU. And of course, uh, when you look at food safety, which is a big problem, then uh, for Moldova, the investment, you know, is not so big. When it comes to Ukraine, uh, just only to make the animal register, you need millions and millions of dollars to organize that. And this is the problem. So the country just needs much more finance to, to modernize the agriculture. But uh, as I know, they have the will, and uh, they will go ahead. I was worried someone was going to ask me a question I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> um, you know, I, we, uh, I'm the editor of uh, both Pro Agriculture and Pro Trade, and our focus on uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation has been heavily trade-oriented. Um, and, and Russia's uh, sort of blocking all U.S. and European goods from coming in and the trouble that's caused them. Um, I don't have, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, U.S. Uh, policy that might affect Ukrainian agriculture, but now I'm going to look into it. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for all the great questions. Um, we're going to have the chairman of the board come up and give us the closing remarks. John? Chairman of the I European forgot. Board, excuse me. I forgot I was chairman of the board. Was... Europe? Yes. But I thought I was retired, but I do have that one job. But uh, I, I think I'd like to thank all the panelists for uh, participating, and especially all of you for uh, uh, making an effort and spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, it, as I said earlier, is a remarkable day, a remarkable event, and... Uh, uh, you know, I, I, in one sense, represent the past, and part of the uh, future that we have going forward 
is going to be built and is built strongly on the achievements that uh, we've, and the discoveries. We've learned a lot about building agriculture enterprises, building in sustainability, having an impact that continues to last, and that most importantly empowers people and empowers enterprises. And this is essential if we're going to change the equation in the world in terms of not just addressing poverty and enhancing food security, but I think it's critical to the whole concept of promoting democracy in the sense that uh, it's always true, and I'm a great follower of Hernando de Soto, who is the famous Peruvian uh, uh, economist who wrote The Mystery of Capital. And part of the solution to all this, if we look over time, is that if you empower people economically, even with a little bit of money, you empower them politically. So we're at a transition. We have a new brilliant team. and. Uh, what I'd like to do, if uh, I can just amend the program a little bit, is rather than have the first, the last word, invite our new CEO up here just to uh, wrap it up as he sees the future. And if we were even to think about gathering here 10 years, 10 years from now, I hope I'm still here, but uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, it's up to you, Sivan. You've got, you've got the lead anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that you uh, will agree with me that you guys are so impressive. Together, we are cultivating new frontiers for the development of agriculture. I would like to thank you very much for your contributions today. And I'm sure that you have additional questions. We'll have a cocktail, a reception in a few minutes, and our uh, speaker, panelists, will be there to uh, answer some of your questions. One thing that is important to keep in mind the reason for why CNFA is there, the reason for why we are celebrating 30 years this year, is because we are working hard day after day to improve the quality of life of farmers, their workers, and their families. And this is the reason for why I'm coming to my job every day. It's the reason for why I spent 15 years of my life in Africa. And I'm asking the CNFA family and our industry as well to keep this in mind. It's so critical. Together, we can achieve this huge challenge. Uh, before finishing this celebration, I would like to uh, thank uh, the US government to USAID, MCC, uh, USDA, the Department of State, they are all a strong supporter of CNFA. And also other uh, uh, donors, uh, the Gates Foundation, for, for instance, the Rockefeller Foundation, which was part of the funding of CNFA. That said, before we move to the next phase of this celebration, I'd like to invite here uh, two uh, giants of the US agriculture, Two former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States, uh, one under President Clinton and another one under President Reagan. I uh, would like to have Mr. John Block and Mr. Mike S.P. here. And um, I have something to grab here. And I would like to invite as well my predecessor, Mr. John Costello, to come here. And we have a little presence here. It's a picture. It's a picture representing the launching of CNFA 30 years ago at the White House. And you can see, you can recognize Mr. Costello at the end of this table and President Reagan. And we have other giant of our country as well, such as Mr. Carlucci, who after that became uh, Secretary of Defense. So this is for you, John, celebrating 20 years of success with CNFA. You are teaching me. You are inspi inspire me every day. Thank Congratulations. You. Well, you can't. Uh, <laughs> you 
you can't ask us up here and give me a microphone and, and expect us to say nothing. Uh, I'm Mike Espy. I'm uh, glad to have been a part of the CNFA on its board of directors for the last seven years. Uh, just uh, let me say uh, very quickly that uh, without uh, this gentleman on my right, Mr. Uh, uh, Costello, I mean, we would uh, we'd be way behind. Uh, we want to thank him for his leadership, thank him for his guidance, thank him for his brain power. And last night we were uh, having libations at a uh, local uh, establishment drinking adult beverages. And we, we were talking about reminiscing of uh, regarding a 30 year history of, of CNFA. And I think he told me an untruth. Uh, he told me that um, uh, about, uh, about this meeting, I suppose, and uh, how he was not even at the table. You know, you had such uh, administration luminaries there uh, that they put him in the ante room, not even at the table. But here we can see that that's not true because he's actually leading the discussion. So without him, without his expertise and guidance, uh, we wouldn't be near as, uh, as successful as we've been. And thank you for your service, your leadership, and uh, he's still on the board of directors, the chairman of CNFA Europe, and a regular member now of the board as we now turn the leadership over to Sylvain Roy. John? Well, I had not planned on speaking, but I'm not let you get very far ahead of me, Michael. So, <laughs> no. Now, the whole thing is, uh, John Costello uh, turned to me and almost 30 years ago, I don't know, 28 or so or nine, and so I came on the board, as, yep. and we've been here a long time, John. We have. But we have. thank you for we've your... We've been in some tight spots. Tight spots, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for your leadership, and right. it's been an honor for me to work with you. Well, the Congratulations. Honor's mine, really. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much for attending this very interesting discussions today, and we are, we are pleased to invite you for the next phase, which is the reception. See you there. <laughs>